This is a picture of me when I was 17 years old. It was taken on the 25th of August 2011 when I was in my first year of sixth form and it was exactly two months before the deadline for medicine applications. But if you're at all familiar with my story, you know that I in fact did not make the applications for that year. Yet here I am, eight years later, aged 26 and three months into my medicine course. Now, over the last three years, I have been documenting my journey in a little mini-series called The Medicine Diaries. And I really hope that by sharing my story, you can find something in there that is either comforting or informative, or just something that you can relate to, that you can apply to your own journey, wherever you are. But before I get into it, I just want to say that this is just my story. It is just one story. And since I've started university, I've been working with an amazing group of students who are incredible and who are passionate as part of a society called the Birmingham Widening Access to Medical Sciences. And essentially what we want to do is to try and help as many people who are aspiring doctors and want to get into any kind of healthcare or science courses, kind of get there by providing information and advice and host events and conferences. And recently, we have launched our channel called We Are Medics. So if you don't want to just hear my one story and you want to hear from lots of students with lots of very different perspectives, then go on over to that channel, check us out. We're going to have videos all about interviews, all about um, applying, all about writing a personal statement, and lots of wonderful stuff like that. So come along and join us because you may find something on there that can really help you out. All right, so let's go back to the girl in the picture, 17 year old me. And despite looking like a 30 year old secretary with those glasses, I know, I know, I was in fact 17. And the picture you see is a picture of me on my first day of work experience, my first ever hospital experience, I hadn't been to a hospital before, don't have any doctors in my family, we don't have any like doctor family friends. And the way I got this work experience by basically coming across a talk, I think my school had organized some sort of a talk and um, a doctor gave a speech and he left his email address at the end. And I remember being like, oh, oh my God, there's, there's somebody, there's somebody who I vaguely know. And I remember emailing him and just kind of explaining that I'm a student and this is what I want to do. And he was very kind in letting me come and shadow him. And the funniest thing is that I kept a log of my couple of days in a hospital. And I have to make a separate video about that because I've literally written about all of the procedures I saw and how I felt. And it's really, really weird reflecting back or like reading back on what I had reflected on when I was 17. So I'll make a separate video on that. But anyway, because the consultant who I was shadowing happened to be an anaesthetist, I got to spend a lot of my time in the hospital in the surgical theatre. And guys, I was fascinated by surgery and to this day I still am. But going back to the picture, the girl you see here is not someone who's very confident. And although I loved science back then as much as I do now, I was predicted ABB in my A-levels and everything else about my application would have been considered average. My UK CAT scores were average, my personal statement was average, and I didn't have access to as much volunteering work or work experience as I do now, or I guess I did when I was a few years older. And I remember always comparing myself to other people in my school who wanted to do medicine, and I would look and think, gosh, they're so assertive and they're so confident, and that's just not me. Like, maybe I just don't have the personality to go into medicine. But the funniest thing of all is that eight years later, a bunch of those people who I felt intimidated by didn't even go into science. Like they didn't, not only did they not do medicine, but they didn't even do anything sciencey. So that's just something to bear in mind. Anyway, like I said, I didn't make my application that year. And in addition to some of the stuff that I just mentioned, the thing that really tipped me over the edge was the well-meaning advice that the consultant I was shadowing said. I vividly remember giving him my personal statement because he had offered to have a look and give some comments. And when he was reading through, he was like, hmm, so do you play any professional sports? And I was like, no, not really. And he was like, what about instruments? Do you play any instruments at grade eight or higher? And again, I was like, no, not really. I'm kind of like the arty kid. I draw and I paint and stuff. And he was like, mm, yes, mm, yeah, okay, well, you know, medicine is very competitive and they want to see well-rounded people. And um, I think you should really work on trying to 
pad your application out in the sense of talking a lot more about like the hobbies and the extracurricular things you do. And while that is not bad advice in general, I think being someone who's underconfident, having two months left until the application, and having complete imposter syndrome about what I was capable of and what I could go on to do, that sort of was the nail in the coffin for me. And I just decided that, you know what, maybe medicine just isn't for me. Instead, I ended up applying to biomedical sciences at Newcastle University. And this was my first choice. I absolutely loved and still do love science. And that's what I ended up doing for the next three years. And I have spoken a lot about biomedical sciences on my channel. But to this day, I can definitely say that I have no regrets. If I could go back and do it all over again, I would absolutely go to Newcastle. I would absolutely study biomedical sciences. So naturally, biomed sort of set me towards this trajectory towards research. And I remember it was in the summer after my second year where I managed to get in touch with a PI at the university and go and do a 10 week summer project in a breast cancer research lab. And to this day, I am not quite sure if the PI who decided to take me in for the 10 weeks knows how grateful I am for those 10 weeks and how much of a big difference that made to everything that I went on to do in the next couple of years. Now, fast forward to the end of my third year of Biomed. And at this point, I had already decided to sort of take a gap year or like take a year out and just travel and work and just get some life experience. And it was during this year that I decided that I want to go and do a research master's to kind of boost my knowledge and confidence or whatever in the hopes of going and doing a PhD after that. Now, I chose to do a master's called Translational Cancer Medicine at King's College London and mostly because, well, A, it was cancer research and I'd already fallen in love with it at this point. And B, because the course was an MRES, which meant that you spent 12 months solidly in the lab, as opposed to doing six months of teaching and a six month project. And I wanted to get as much hands-on experience as I possibly could. And my God, my masters looking back was definitely one of the best and one of the most difficult things I have ever done. And it was difficult because I was in the lab on my own a lot of the times and it was a case of just having to work independently and learn from other people and ask for help. But through all of that, I got to work with some amazing, amazing scientists, but also with some amazing, amazing doctors. In fact, my first supervisor was a clinical oncologist and we worked together on a triple negative breast cancer project. You know, it's funny how these things kind of go around in circles, isn't it? But anyway, we worked on a triple negative breast cancer project together. And I remember going with her to sit in clinics and speak to patients. And I think through doing all of that and getting all of that experience, it kind of reminded me why I wanted to do medicine back when I was much younger. And it sort of was like the impetus for me to actually consider applying again. And now by this point, I had already started my YouTube channel and I was making videos all about what it's like to be a research student and what it's like to work in the labs. And it was around that time when I was thinking about starting medicine that my Medicine Diaries series was born. I've got to say, I'm kind of nervous about starting this series because if I fail, it's going to be on the internet for everyone to see. And side note, I did in fact fail in my first year of applying. And it was in fact on the internet for all to see. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen it or not, but in another video of mine, I talked about how I want to get into medicine and how I've been wanting to do this for a little while, but I've been kind of apprehensive to talk about it on my channel in case, you know, I don't get in or I fail or just I have to explain myself. And I was trying to avoid doing that because it is scary. It is a scary long procedure and there are no guarantees. But having said that, I'm in the position now where I'm looking at a lot of other YouTube videos talking about their experience of how they got into medicine, the entry exams, how they got work experience, writing a personal statement, and all of that fun stuff. And one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of these videos that people have made, they have made in retrospect. So a lot of them who have already made videos, they've made videos talking about their prior experiences. So what I thought I would do is start a series called, I don't know, The Medicine Diaries or The Med School Diaries. In fact, if you have a name for the series, do leave it below because I'm interested to hear. But I thought I would make a series where I would document my entire steps 
as it happens. Because I know something I find quite daunting is when I watch other people talk about their experiences. Sometimes it does sound all too easy and I know that it's not. So this can be a better representation, I suppose. So as I mentioned in the video, it was quite a scary thing to put myself out there and kind of declare to the world that this is what I'm doing. And I will link that first video as well as all of the other videos in the series below if you want to kind of go back and watch some of them. But I remember thinking to myself that a lot of the videos that I was watching around the time were people talking about getting into medicine retrospectively. So what I mean is that they'd already gotten in and they were talking about it in like the past tense. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it have been nice to be able to watch somebody go through the entire process and kind of document their ups and their downs. And because something like that didn't exist, or at least I couldn't find it, I thought, I'm gonna do it. It's scary, but why not? And the other advantage of it for me was that it would be a good way for me to keep myself accountable and think that, okay, so I've got this small group of people who are following my journey. I want to really, you know, keep at it because I have some people to keep me accountable. And so, once I had made the decision to actually apply, the next step was looking into postgraduate versus undergraduate courses and trying to see which one is for me. The main purpose of this video is talking about undergraduate versus postgraduate medicine. A friend of mine who's actually coming to study medicine uh, at King's in September sent me this really amazing link and it's got all of the universities that do postgraduate medicine, undergraduate medicine, and the number of applicants per place, you know, the kind of work experience you need, the grades you need. It's a really, really like amazing comprehensive document. And when he sent me that the other day, I was just like, oh my God, I need to share it with people because some people might not know it, it, it exists. And well, it's helping me out a lot. So I'm sure it'll help some of you guys out too. Ah, uh, it's so funny watching this clip back because the friend who I mentioned in that video, Ben, hi, if you're watching, is now in his third year of graduate medicine or fourth year of an undergraduate course and he's going to become a doctor in less than two years. That blows my mind. Anyway, I know a lot of you guys who are watching these videos are grads and do want to apply to graduate medicine. So I will link below the document that I mentioned because I remember finding it super useful myself and I think it should still be up. Um, so I will link it below in case you want to go and have a look because you may find it useful. And I do have to give a little bit of credit and appreciation where it's due, but my friend Ben was so supportive through all of my process of getting in and yeah, I just want to say I am really grateful to have really supportive friends. Anyway, fast forward a couple of weeks and I managed to get myself a week of work experience at Surrey Hospital by getting in touch with a consultant surgeon who my good friend Felix put me in touch with. Again, you'll notice a theme throughout this entire video that most of like the opportunities and experiences that I got were almost accidental in the sense that I would mention, oh, this is what I want to do. And then somebody would be like, oh, well, I know this person. Do you want me to put you in touch? And I'd be like, oh, yes, please. So if you're in the process of trying to get work experience or organize things like that, bear that in mind. You'll be surprised who is there to help you and who may know something that you don't that can be beneficial to you. So. Bear that in mind. Anyway, this lovely surgeon allowed me to come and shadow her and her team for a week. And this is what happened. Hey everyone, so it is eight in the evening now. I am absolutely exhausted. I got back from the hospital um, an hour or so ago, but I've been working on the application that I was telling you about. As I said, I didn't film much of the hospital itself, obviously privacy, respect, etc. Um, but here, is a nice picture of me all scrubbed up, in case you guys wanted to see that. So I actually got to sit in two different surgeries today and both of them were um, in gynecology and involved the removal of ovaries and the uterus. But the first patient, guys, it was so shocking that um, because of her cancer, an ovary, which is usually this size, had grown into this ginormous cyst, I'm not kidding, the size of my head, probably more than 20 centimeters wide. And it was absolutely incredible to see the surgeons go in there and take it out and take out any residual um, tumor or cancer that was already in her and just put it back together. And it was just utterly amazing to see. Yeah, as I mentioned, it was like 
utterly incredible and while the surgeons were carrying on with the rest of the operation the cyst that had been removed was placed in this white container and the nurse was about to package it up to send it to i presume pathology but then like she came up to me with this kind of like look of mischief in her face and she kind of just looked at me and was like do you want to poke it and i must have just looked back at her in astonishment and shock and replied oh my god yes please <laughs> Hey everyone, so it's still day two of the Surrey Hospital Shadowing Work Experience week. That was a long sentence. Um, and it is half six right now and I've just gotten back from the hospital and I am at the labs because I just have a couple of, you know, admin lab things to get to be getting on with. Oh, and at this point I was still in the middle of doing my masters. So after spending like an entire day at Surrey and having to commute from London, I remember coming back and having to go back to the labs and kind of just tend to my cells to make sure they didn't die. So as I said yesterday, I was in theatres all day and I got to see two surgeries and today was really great because I got to go and see those um, patients in the ward after they had woken up. Both of them seemed to be doing well under a little bit of pain as you can imagine but it was really amazing to have that transition between um, you know, seeing them in surgery and what is quite like a mechanical procedure to actually seeing them in person and seeing how the surgeons interact with them and make sure they're okay and you know they're well and they're not in pain etc. So as well as doing that week in Surrey Hospital because I was doing my masters at Guy's Hospital in London I also managed to get around a total of two weeks of work experience within the oncology wards within the cancer clinics and because the project that I was working on at the time was cancer immunology. I was working a lot with blood for my research. And up to that point, because I was in a hospital, I had to rely on the nurses or the doctors and sort of asking these people to take the blood for me. But after having a bit of a chat with my supervisor, she just said to me, well, you know, why don't you just go and do a course and learn to take blood yourself? It'll help you with your own project and also it'll be a good thing to mention on your personal statement for medicine. And lo and behold, that's what I did. So the course I did consists of two parts. The first part of the course was kind of like a classroom based kind of situation where a whole bunch of us went there and we went through this booklet and it just taught us a bit more about, you know, the structure of veins, you know, the history of phlebotomy, how you do and don't treat patients, etc. But I can definitely say that one of the best things that came out of me going and doing this uh, phlebotomy course and learning how to take blood is meeting my friend Rachel. We met on the course, we took blood from each other, and to this day we still send each other like blood or like vampire related memes. Who knew learning to take blood together can bond you like that? But apparently it can. So I'm vlogging today because today is the second part of my phlebotomy training. Finished the session and again we took blood from each other. Do you want to show yours? Okay, I would, I, would, I would show yours but mine is like under here. Um, it went well. It did. I think did. And the, nurse, um, the nurse who was training us the first time I today, she was really lovely. And she was like saying that she was like really impressed with us, which either means we're good or it means that she's had a lot of other bad stuff. Yeah, you never know what the, yeah, where the We'd bar like is. to believe the first one yeah. though, obviously. <laughs> so we did the course, we qualified, and I immediately decided to put my uh, new skills to use by bleeding every friend, colleague, or nearby person who was brave enough to let me take blood from them. And I'm about to show you a picture of me getting ready to take blood from Jack, so if you aren't a fan, heads up. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly show you the equipment we're using. Jack is there getting ready. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is take blood in these tubes. These have got EDTA in them and that is just an anticoagulant to make sure that the blood doesn't clot. I'm going to be using a tourniquet as you will see in a minute. Um, also a plaster for the end. I have got a 23G ga 23 gauge butterfly needle and I'll show you that in a minute and it's got the vacutainer attached to it. I've already washed my hands and I'm also going to be wearing gloves and yeah I think that's pretty much everything. Maybe I'll in the actual phlebotomy video I'll talk in more detail about everything. So I'll pause the clip right there because the actual clip of me taking the blood is quite long and um, because I wanted to kind of go through all of the steps and I do literally show you the entire process. So if you're interested in that, I'll link the video below, but I just want to say thank you to Jack because if it wasn't for all of his blood donations, I genuinely don't think I would have finished my project in time. So uh, thank you for your wonderful white blood cells. 
Fantastic. Well done. How was how was the experience? Oh, wonderful. No, good. it was good. Very ten painless. Out ten. ten out of ten. Very painless. Very good. I'll try and catch up with him um, later in a day or so and try and see how it looks. That's why I usually do just to make sure there isn't any bruising or anything like that. And there you have it. Now, when it comes to work experience and doing volunteer work, something that I consistently tell any student that I speak to is that it doesn't really matter what you do or how much you've done it. There are two things that matter the most. The first one being is how you reflect on the experiences that you have had. And the second is how long have you been doing these things for? Because that is a way that the medical schools can kind of gauge your dedication and your perseverance in carrying something out for a long time. And as I said, because up to this point, I had already got a fair bit of work experience in a hospital, I wanted to do something in a community. I wanted to volunteer, maybe work with elderly people or children or in a care home. And what I came across was something called a befriending scheme at my local hospice. And essentially what the scheme is, is that you get paired with a hospice patient in the community who may be isolated and may not have a lot of family or relatives around and you essentially act as a friend and you offer emotional and social support and what we would have to do is report back to the hospice on a weekly basis just to keep them updated on how the patient is doing. So if the patient is struggling, like either emotionally or even physically, we would speak back and report back to the hospice. And it was a really, really good way for the hospice to almost keep track of their patients in the community. So as you can tell, because this is another one of my Medicine Diaries videos, you can kind of guess my initial motive for wanting to do voluntary work at a hospice. But as I said in my intro, since starting, I've realized that it's so much more than that. And part of this video is for me to share my experience with you. But for any of you who are also even slightly considering volunteering, I really hope that this video can be the tipping point for you to be really pumped up to go out there and give something, some of your time or some of your assets to other people. Now, I'm going to be the first one to put my hand up and say that the reason why I pursued this volunteering to begin with was because of medicine. You know, I wanted to get work experience, I wanted to volunteer. But I can't tell you how much of an enriching experience this happened to be. Still, I can say that it was one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done. And I ended up doing this for 17 months, every Sunday afternoon for an hour or two, with the exception of a couple of missed weekends. And I can truly say that I found a friend with in the old lady that I was going to see, and I really hope that she felt the same way. Now, this is the part of the video where things start taking a little bit of a bumpy turn in my Medicine Diaries series. Starting with the UK cat, or what is now called the UCAT. So it has been a while since I've made one of my Medicine Diaries videos. I've been finishing off my MRES, which was my master's, and I've officially finished. I can't believe this, I'm a free woman. And because of that, and because the last couple of weeks of my MRES were, you know, so stressful and I had a deadline, Honestly, medicine wasn't really at the forefront of my priorities. I had originally booked my UK CAT for the 5th of September, bearing in mind that as I'm filming this is the 1st of September. So a while ago I was like, oh, that's a good idea, I will just book my test for the 5th because then as soon as I finish with my um, course then, you know, I would have been doing a little bit of practice here and there, so yeah, I'll probably be ready. No, I am absolutely not ready. Okay. UK cat. So I have said this test a total of three times now and on all three occasions I have definitely not gotten anything above average. And I've beat myself about this quite a lot and there is a specific Medicine Diaries videos about the UK cat which I'll come on to. But I just want to take the second to say that there are other ways of getting into medical school without the UK cat. I got into Birmingham because at the time when I was applying Birmingham didn't have a UK CAT admissions exam. And also guys, I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again, there is a bit of a method to the UK CAT and you do just have to put the time in, um, which is something I definitely did not do. But I know from people who I've spoken to that if you do put the time in and if you do apply certain methods and techniques, then you can definitely improve. So bear that in mind. Anyway, moving on. 
I didn't make a Medicine Diaries videos for quite a while after that last video, and when I did, this is what I had to say. So, a disaster after a disaster, but this is just the way it has come to be, and all I can do is try to make the next best step and just keep going that way. Yes, so what I had said in my very first video that and I'm kind of worried that if I fail it'll be up on the internet for all to see, that happened. <laughs> and do you know what the weirdest part of that was? Is that it wasn't half as scary as I had imagined it to be. I mean, being rejected is never a fun thing, but the clip that I showed you was from a video called Why I was rejected from medicine and the mistakes I made. And looking back at it now, it's one of my most viewed videos and I think it's one of those videos where I've had a lot of comments and a lot of feedback of people saying that sharing some of my mistakes helped them not make it, not make those mistakes and I guess be successful in their applications. That being where I am now, I can look back and go, you know what? It wasn't that bad of a thing in a grand scale of things. Don't get me wrong, I was not happy about it at the time, but I think I kind of got to a point where I just thought, I'm just going to have to take this failure on the chin and just carry on. And do you know what? It isn't all doom and gloom. Despite what has happened and the mistakes I made and the outcomes I have got gotten, this is only the start of my journey. I'm not giving up. I'm going to try again. I'm going to do better this time and learn from my mistakes. And once again, I will be continuing to take you along on my journey. And I mentioned this in the video too, but the silver lining was that around this time I was in a new job that I loved and I got to do research and see patients. And I'm really, really grateful for having that opportunity while still pursuing medicine and still trying to get in. And after that, the process started again. In terms of the kind of things that I'm doing differently and what I'm doing outside of work, I'm still continuing to do my volunteering at Royal Trinity Hospice. I have to say, despite everything, I am still hopeful and I am excited. And I keep telling myself this and I hope that you guys might kind of find some comfort in it as well. And that is, I know how disheartening it can be to get rejections, but I just keep saying to myself that, look, you want this. You want this really badly. So just, just do all you can, take your steps take your strides and try and enjoy the journey while you can as well. So I spoke a lot about getting rejections in that video and now some of you might be able to relate to me and maybe some of you can't. But for anybody who can, I can just say that rejections can feel so personal sometimes and there is definitely an art to not letting them get to you and sort of just getting up, shaking yourself off and carrying on. And it's something that I'm still learning. I'm not sure if anybody fully, fully is okay with getting rejected. Um, but I can say this, that every time you do experience a rejection or like a bit of a failure or something, it does make you a little bit stronger to deal with the next rejection. So I can say this to you as a bit of, again, a silver lining if you experience some sort of failure or rejection right now. It might be worth bearing in mind. So today I'm going to be making a video all about the dreaded UK cat. So I'm going to be taking the exam again this year and I wanted to come on here and make a video talking to you about how I've been practicing, what kind of resources I've been using. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video right there and give you a spoiler. It did not go well. I will however say that I did not practice as much as I should have and I know that. So I'm filming a little bit of an impromptu vlog because I've literally just got back from doing my UK cat and this is literally like fresh off the grill news. I thought I will literally, as soon as I've arrived home, I will get my sheet of paper um, conveniently folded and tell you what I've got. So um, it's not good, it's definitely not good, but if I've noticed anything from watching lots of UK cat videos is that most people who share their results have done very well and I made myself the promise that no matter what grades I got, no matter how, I guess, you know, not quite so proud I was of them, that I was going to share them with you anyway because I think it's important. And I still stand by that. I definitely deliberated about whether I should share my actual results or not, but I think in the end I kind of got to the point where I was like, you know, it is what it is, and I'm just gonna put it out there to maybe make other people feel better. 
either because they've gotten a lot better than me, so they can just be like, whew, at least we didn't get her score, or if they got something similar, maybe they could find a little bit of comfort in knowing that they're not the only ones. But as with everything else in life, sometimes you just have to keep calm and carry on. And for me, the next step was BMAT. The BMAT exam is around September, so I want to say a really, really big thank you to all of you who've written and sent in such supportive comments after the UK CAT video. I know that I did seem, you know, really chirpy and stuff in the video, and I explained how I felt exactly, but I think there was still a part of me that felt a bit disappointed because obviously it does narrow down your medical school choices. So for all of you guys who send me lovely comments and, you know, just being supportive and saying, you know, we've been there or like, you know, just keep at it. And um, I really, really appreciate it. And I guess I just have to work twice as hard for the BMAT and possibly spend more time actually revising than making YouTube videos about the BMAT, which is kind of what I did on the UK CAT. Ah, the best laid plans of mice and men. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please Google that quote, because that's what my next video is going to be all about. So I guess to cut a long story short, I got, if I remember correctly, um, 3.9 in section 1, 3.5 in section 2, and a 4A on my essay. So with the exception of the essay, which I'm personally very happy about, sections 1 and 2 weren't amazing. And I'm really sad in a way, guys. I'm like frustrated and sad that this is the second video within a very short span of time that I'm making saying, these are the results I got and they weren't good. If you haven't seen it already, not so long ago, I made a video called My UK Care Results 2018. And again, you know, it's funny. It's like I lived like deja vu. Um, I was kind of struggling to find enough time and I was struggling to kind of uh, develop like good exam techniques for these exams in a very short time that I had left. Um, and exactly like the other one, about a week before I had a bit of a meltdown and then preceding that it was kind I was kind of like eerily calm but I think I was at a point where I was like well do you know what it doesn't matter now I have like three days left I'm just gonna go and do it and see what happens and this is what happened. <laughs> you know it's really funny watching that clip because I just think I'm so glad that I made those videos because right now that I'm actually in medical school, I have like a thousand and one new problems and new things to be worried about. And because I'm already here, I think it's easy to forget that getting here wasn't always smooth sailing and there were a lot of ups and downs. And maybe if you were to ask me about my BMATs right now, I would probably say something like, well, oh, you know, it wasn't great, but it doesn't matter because I got in anyway. Whereas at the time, I would not have been that blasé about it. At the time, it felt like a big thing. So yeah, it is kind of funny to watch these clips back. Anyway, fast forward a couple of weeks and I finally sent off my medicine application. Around the 10th or the 11th of October, I sent off my application for medicine. Ooh, it honestly feels like such a big load lifted because if any of you guys have applied to medicine or did apply to medicine in this um, round of applications, you know that it's not just a thing you do when you send off. It's literally like weeks if not months of preparation for all of your entrance exams and writing a personal statement and getting references. So oh, I am very happy. I can honestly sit here and tell you that I did my best to portray myself through my personal statement and everything through my application and I guess the next thing I can do is just sit and wait in anticipation for potential interviews which I'm keeping my fingers crossed for. Ugh, making that video was so cathartic and so therapeutic and I mentioned it in the clip but there's just this weird sensation when you've done something and you think to yourself, okay, I've done my part now. Now I've just let it out into the, into the air, into the universe, and I just have to wait and see what comes back. But then I started experiencing something that is a little bit bizarre, and that's what I spoke about in my next video. So since sending off my medicine application, 
I realized that for some very strange reason, it's been quite difficult for me to come back on a camera and make videos. I haven't quite got an explanation as to why that is, but I can compare it to when you start watching a TV series and you binge watch it and you're so involved in it, and then the series ends and you essentially feel like your life has no meaning anymore. And that's a little bit like how I've been feeling after sending everything off. Because I was working towards that for like the longest time, now that it's all done, and it's been two weeks since it's all been finished and out of the way. I'm a bit like, what do I do now? But actually, come to think of it, I did feel a similar thing when I had finished my master's and I had handed in my final thesis. I remember there was like a moment where I was like sat in the labs and I was like thinking to myself, what am I going to do with my life now? And <laughs> it took me a good like week or so to kind of just come out of that mindset and say, you have the summer, go have fun. That's what you do with your life now. Anyway, after this, the angst of waiting to hear back started to kick in. And I thought I would make a quick chatty update video, mostly because I desperately, desperately want to ask you guys who have applied for medicine this year, have you heard anything back? I promised myself when I applied that I wouldn't be one of those people who would be desperately checking track, um, UCAS track, to see what's happening with my application. But lo and behold, we're at the end of November now and I haven't heard anything and I don't know if this is normal because some of my friends who applied for graduate entry medicine said that you can start hearing back around this time but then at the same time I know for undergraduate medicine it may take months to hear anything back so I thought the best thing I can do is come on here and ask you guys but you know despite not having heard anything back by this point I maybe naively or maybe optimistically decided that I'm going to start doing a little bit of interview prep anyway, just in the off chance that I did get an interview. And I remember having to do some work in the labs, so that's where the next clip is filmed. Okay, we're here. This is my icebox. it up I am going to coat my Eliza plate and while I do that as promised I can talk to you a little bit about the interview prep. Let's get my reagents. Okay I'll put you guys there. So while I wait for my capture reagents to thaw I guess I can tell you a little bit about the interview prep I mentioned in the intro. So I'll be perfectly honest with you, yesterday was the first day that I actually started looking at a little bit of interview prep because if you are in this position or you have been in this position, it's kind of tough to know if you should or shouldn't start prepping because you aren't guaranteed an interview and it's a lot of work and mental strain, especially if you're like me who um, has a full-time job and I have lots of other commitments. It's kind of difficult to know where you should spend your time. Having said that, the thought of not doing any prep at all was starting to give me anxiety, so I thought I would start with the basics. And I would definitely still say this now to those of you who have applied for medicine and are waiting to hear back. I would say if you do have a little bit of spare time, maybe start watching medical news, maybe start reading some articles about ethics or public health or things like that, because they're not that labor intensive and they're generally quite interesting anyway and they may help you out if you do end up getting an interview. And next, it was time for the rejections and the interviews to start rolling in. So I hadn't heard anything back until about two weeks or so ago and I was reading all of your comments and a lot of you were saying, well, we either got rejections or interviews and I was thinking, oh my God, why haven't, haven't I heard anything back? It's like getting December now and a lot of people start hearing back in November. But Lo and behold, my first university that got in touch, or my first option, was King's for undergrad. And unfortunately, it was a rejection. Now, they were one of the universities that actually gave me a reason as to why they rejected me. And not surprisingly, if you've been keeping up with my videos, they said that my UK cat was too low. So, the second option that got back to me was Birmingham. And this was for the four-year graduate entry route, or the graduate entry course. Eventually, I got an email 
at 7.30 in the evening, I believe. Not late afternoon, early evening. Um, so I've just been like anxiously on my phone. And there it was, that was the official interview system portal and yeah. So we've got one rejection and one interview so far. And there we had it, my very first and only, may I add, interview. To cut a long story short, I did end up receiving rejections from King's, UCL and Oxford and I think the general consensus feedback from all three of them was that my BMAT and my UK CAT weren't high enough, which wasn't much of a shock to me. But next up, let me share with you one of the most exciting things that I have ever shared on my channel. On the 6th of December 2018, I got an email from the head of the medicines admissions team at Birmingham University offering me an interview for their graduate entry medicine program. The interview itself was to be on the 14th of January 2019, giving me just over four weeks to prepare. Everything else that you're about to see in the rest of this video is what followed in the week before the interview itself. And I essentially made a vlog of that entire week running up to the interview, all the way from preparing a few days before, right until the morning. Good morning, it is the morning of the interview and it's early as always because I'm just an early bird um, and I'm in the hotel room reading through a bunch of my notes and resources last minute. I think the next time I'll pick up the camera is either when I'm heading to the interview or just after. Wish me luck! I'm about to head out the door now. I can't tell you how nervous I feel. Let's hope it goes well. See you after. So currently it is Thursday the 7th of February 2019. It is 7.05 a.m. And on Monday, Monday the 4th of February, I received an email from the admissions tutors at Birmingham to say that my interview had been successful and that they would like to offer me a place to study medicine. I I honestly have no words. Three days have passed and I'm still in utter shock. And you know what guys, that buzz of, oh my god, I actually got in, still hasn't left me. It still is like bizarre to me. But something that I didn't speak a lot about when it was actually happening was that I definitely did have a period of doubting everything. Doubting medicine, doubting myself, thinking to myself, what am I going to do? What if I don't get in? And the reason why I didn't make a video about that while it was happening is because I was still processing a lot of stuff. But the next video that I'm going to show you is when enough time had passed and I had already gotten my offer from Birmingham and it just felt like the right time to speak about it. Before I got my interview, I had a massive breakdown about medicine and I was still working at my previous job. And I started having all of these doubts about, am I even going to get in? Am I good enough to be a doctor? Am I good enough to get into medical school? Am I getting too old? Because I'm 25 now, guys, and I know that that's definitely not the oldest person on a lot of grad courses. But it did go through my head that, okay, so if you start this year, you'll be 26. If you don't get in, you might be 27 or 28 or 29 by which time most of my friends are getting married and buying houses and, you know, starting their proper careers. And I essentially panicked. That panic was definitely not fun. But I chose to speak about it because I think, not everybody, but I think a lot of us do go through phases like that where we kind of just doubt everything and kind of question everything that we've done. And I'm not exempt from that. Um, and sometimes when we have those breakdowns, in a way they're useful because you come out of it uh, with more of an understanding of what it is that you want to do. I remember coming out of my little panic meltdown and thinking, no, no, this is what I want to do. I'm just a little bit scared. And after that video, I made an entire video all about what my actual experience of an MMI interview was like. I was genuinely too shy and too like nervous to speak so I kind of just like sat there quietly like kind of counting my minutes and um, trying to get my uh, anxiousness under control but after that it was pretty much the start of the waiting game until my course began 
It is officially four months until I start medical school, so I wanted to kind of update you on what I've been doing since, I guess, my last video where I talked about getting accepted. And also, I really want to know what you guys are up to. How are you coping with this wait? Honestly, like, I'm simultaneously so excited and so ready to start, but I'm also like, no, I don't want to leave my friends and my job and my life. So, I don't know. Are any of you guys experiencing that? Let me know, so at least I know I'm not the only one. The final clip that you've just seen was six months ago, and things have changed so much since then. Not just in terms of uni, but just in my personal life as well. I'm now three months into my course and it has been chaotic and stressful and amazing and fast paced and I've been working really hard to try and almost keep my head above the water because grad med is hard guys or at least I find it difficult and what I would say to you whether you're already in medical school or whether you're a doctor or whether you're a student or just somebody who has a general interest in medicine is that no matter where you are or where you're going Take the time to become a bit of an observer in your own life. Take the time to slow down now and again and kind of reflect on where you are and where you've been. And most importantly, just take the time to enjoy the little things in the present. Because ultimately, whether you like it or not, you will go from point A to point B. And I think it's all of these little moments that we experience in the present that kind of map the dots in the long run. And I personally am a firm believer that taking this time to kind of just slow down and reflect and just exist will do people a huge amount of good. I sincerely, sincerely hope that you have gained something from this video and that you've enjoyed it because I know it's not a short video and as I said at the beginning, this is just my story, one story amongst many. And if you could relate to it in any way, or if you found it comforting, or I guess relatable in some way, then I've done my job. I wish you nothing but the best, whatever you're doing. And just a final word for any students who do want to apply to medicine. Remember this, that yes, it's competitive, yes, it's hard work, but be kind to yourself and keep at it because we need doctors, we need good doctors. And if you give up too soon, you may just be depriving the world of your skills and your talent and what you have to offer. So do bear that in mind and I think I'm going to end it right there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.